I issued a challenge to our staff for this video. Using only parts from our inventory sheet, assemble a gaming computer that can play 120Hz with 1440p and high settings. Also, keep it as close to $1,700 as possible. We know we can hit 144Hz with 1080p, of course, but moving to 1440p while avoiding multi-GPU does complicate things a bit. Refresh was dropped to 120Hz to make the challenge more achievable, though it also almost certainly necessitates overclocking, something we'll explore here. Before getting to the build, this coverage is brought to you by Catalyst Energy Mints. A three-pack of Catalyst contains the equivalent energy of over 21 energy drinks, and at $20 works out to be more affordable and portable than the energy drink alternative. Use code GAMERSNEXUS for 5% off at the link in the description below. This build was largely a two-man project. Eric Hamilton, writer for the website GAMERSNEXUS.net, and Patrick Lathan worked together to pull up together the parts without going outside of inventory or what I had available. So that means no external purchases, which does complicate things a bit. Part of this, of course, meant they immediately pulled my i7-7700K out of the Gaming Pro Carbon for use in the build, which is here, by the way. And we did run into thermal issues with the Gigabyte Gaming 7, so the Pro Carbon ended up being included in this. But the Gaming 7 did have an update, so I'll have more info for you on that this week. They also threw a GTX 1080 FTW into the mix, as it's our highest clocked card we have, and to save on budget, they further opted for a kit of 8GB of memory, but it's easily overclocked memory, so we're running what is natively a 3200MHz Corsair Dominator Platinum kit, but since this build has an objective of high speed to meet a challenge, they shaved off dollars from higher capacities and opted instead for easy overclocking. As for other parts, the team tossed in a Samsung 850 Evo for the SSD, a Seagate Barracuda drive for the two terabytes of hard disk storage, and then pulled out a dusty Corsair 600C that we liked the thermals for, I think last year when tested it, but it's been in storage since then, so it did have to be cleaned off a bit. Other than that, the power supply used is the same one that we use for our case testing benchmarks, and that is a Corsair RMX series power supply, uh, and then we've got the 1080 FTW for the video card, and one case fan with the rest taken care of by the liquid cooler. Cooling an i7-7700K isn't easy as it turns out, and that is especially true with overclocking. For cooling, my Kraken X62 280mm cooler was looted from its carton and front mounted in the 600C. We found this cooler somewhat necessary for overclocking the 7700K in the review depending on the motherboard, but the case of course also changes that because we're no longer open air. And this depends largely on vCore settings, fortunately that won't matter as much because we're manually tuning. As for the motherboard, we found that our MSI Tomahawk Z270 board, shown in some B-roll shots of this build, limited our overclocks to around 4.8 gigahertz, so that was later swapped for an MSI Gaming Pro Carbon instead. We're hitting a CPU OC of 5.1 gigahertz with that board. Memory was able to sustain almost 3800 megahertz or thereabout with a CL16 timing, and we later overclocked the GPU by another 100 to 125 megahertz offset from base. So how did we do? Well, we didn't quite hit the 120 hertz mark with games at their higher settings because part of my requirement was more AAA games that have come out recently, like Watch Dogs 2, that's very ambitious, Battlefield 1, and GTA 5. It's a bit old now, but still pretty high-end in terms of graphics. It's not hard to hit CSGO, uh, Rocket League, Dota 2, those types of games with 120 or even 144 hertz at 1440p with this setup. That would not be an issue at all. But doing this was a bit different, so as you might expect, it was hard to get those higher frame rates. With GTA 5, we achieved 123 FPS average after all overclocking was applied, though it held a 114 FPS average with slightly lower low values prior to overclocking. This one actually makes the mark of 1440p with 120Hz refresh and does pretty well at sustaining it under load. There are some scenarios that drop us below 120Hz, like some timescale shifting, but not many. Watch Dogs 2, however, isn't so friendly. Even with the overclock, we're only getting to 90.5 FPS average at 1440p with high settings. It'd be possible to hit higher refresh settings with dropped quality, but this game is somewhat of a bear to work with anyway, and you'd still have trouble getting up to that 120 number. With Battlefield 1, we can just barely hit 120 FPS average after all the overclocking and after dropping settings from ultra to high. Still, that's not with a 64-player server, so once you get into multiplayer, FPS will fall hard under those conditions, and you'd likely need to drop the settings to 1080p for resolution and maybe be able to keep quality at high. We ran some of these games at 1080p as well, by the way, just for reference. 
and saw Battlefield 1 and GTA 5 both exceeding requirements for 144Hz gaming. But again, that's at 1080p with a GTX 1080, so it's a very expensive system for 1080p, but if you want high refresh, I guess that's what you have to do for these games. Just for fun, we also ran a Blender workload on the GPU and saw the render finish in about 22 minutes. Given that the CPU rendering workloads were taking something like 42 minutes without the overclock, that's a big advantage for the GPU-enabled rendering, and CUDA helps with that because we're dropping the render time by about half. And just to round out the testing, we did a simple noise test and temperature test on the rig as well. We were hitting about 30 dBA with silent settings on the Kraken and on the rear case fan. 35 dBA with medium noise settings and 51.5 dBA bit loud with performance focus settings and 100% fan speeds. With a gaming workload only and without using our normal deltas here since it was a one-off test, the GPU was hitting 82 Celsius with a 55% fan speed on the GPU. CPU temperature under this workload with performance settings for the cooler stayed around or below 50 C and that's again with a gaming workload. When we tortured both the CPU and GPU simultaneously with synthetic workloads, we were easily hitting 98C on the CPU, but that was with Prime95 and Furmark running at the same time. On an open-air bench, we can stay below 90C under these conditions, but boxing it all into one case really shows the difference because we're having trouble exhausting that air as fast as it's heating up. This is more of a one-off project for the weekend, but it shows that we're kind of approaching those higher refresh capabilities with 1440p with modern hardware and that's a cool thing to see because like we stated with the rx 480 and gtx 1060 when they launched 1440p gaming is pretty much something that can be widespread now as soon as people start adopting the monitors because any 200 plus dollar gpu can handle reasonable if not high or ultra settings at 1440 with a 60 fps plus frame rate for the most part see our reviews for more on that of course but when you look at the higher refreshes, like 120 hertz, this is pretty much getting there with some of these games. GTA 5 and Battlefield are in the maybe territory. GTA 5 definitely. Battlefield 1 is a big maybe, depending on how large the servers are you, that you play on. 144 hertz is still out of range, but with 1080p, not a problem at all, especially if you are okay with going for high settings instead of ultra. 144 hertz with even Battlefield 1 in this rig at high-ish settings was achievable. And that's, again, not something that's really been possible before this latest generation. Of course, Vega will be interesting to see as well for the very same reason. If you're playing things like CSGO and Rocket League and esports titles where you might more likely want 144 hertz as a refresh because you feel like you can actually see the difference or feel the input difference, things like that, that that's been possible for a while now, uh, but this does it a little bit higher resolution and higher settings. So interesting project, fun to do. We'll post a build list in the description below if you want to buy any of the parts used in this PC build, along with the article that contains the full write-up of all the parts. It's really targeted at people who are building their first system in terms of just like a guide of how to build it. So many of you won't need the guide step-by-step -step how to put it together, but it's there if anyone wants it. As always, thank you for watching. Patreon link in the postal video for more information, links in the description below. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.